I'm Martin Fowler. I'm uh, an author and speaker on software development. I refer to myself as a loudmouth on software development because I think words like guru are a bit too pretentious. And a large part of what I do is take a look at the projects that my company ThoughtWorks does, look for interesting ideas and say, hmm, this was a particularly good thing that they did over here. We should do this more widely, not just within ThoughtWorks, but within the industry as a whole. So how can I describe what we did so that more people will be inclined to do it? This is, one of, this is the thing that really led me to writing um, the book on domain-specific languages. The trigger was actually several projects that I looked at, but I'm going to talk about one of them in particular that I think helps illustrate the point fairly well. They were a company, I have to be suitably vague here because of the uh, client confidentiality, but they were a company that had a huge amount of customers who have regular interactions buying stuff with the company. And this company was interested in increasing um, their sales by making various kinds of special programs and special offers. But they wanted these special offers to be targeted to particular kinds of customers whose pattern of interaction with a company fulfilled certain characteristics. So, as you can imagine, there's this huge database out there with all of these customer records, with all these details of various interactions they've had with the company. And what we need to do is to allow the business people to say, I want to pick out people like this and then be able to find those people. Now, of course, all the data is in a database, so it could be done by writing a SQL query. What we find is that despite the predictions of the early days of relational databases, real people don't use SQL that much. In fact, I can't resist this. I discovered this quote from Chris Date, who is one of the early uh, relational gurus. He said this in 1974, and it's an absolute classic. He said, the relational model is a particularly suitable structure for the truly casual user i.e. a non-technical person who merely wishes to interrogate the database. For example, a housewife who wants to make inquiries about this week's best buys at the supermarket. In the not-too-distant future, the majority of computer users will probably at, be at this level. I, I love that quote. I mean, the, the fact that he picks a housewife as well. I mean, it's, it's wrong on so many levels. But anyway, that was the 1970s. We have to forgive him. Um, that quote can't be any worse than the fashions at that time, after all. But anyway, coming back to, uh, to SQL, you know, these are um, serious business people. They're not housewives looking for best buys. So they're not going to use SQL. Um, but they need some way of expressing what kind of deals, what kind of customers can we offer this deal to? How do we describe them properly? And the way that, we'd, that uh, the project team had gone about it is they'd created this very small computer language that was designed in such a way to make it easy for business people to be able to express what they wanted. They did it in collaboration with the business people that say, well, does this kind of structure work for you? There's some back and forth. The language wasn't terribly complicated. It was a good bit less flexible and rich than, say, SQL. Um, it was very particular to the domain they were working in. It had many parts of the language that were very, very specific. But it gave them the flexibility to be able to capture these rules. The business people actually usually didn't write the rules, but they would describe what they wanted. Programmers could then write the rules in this little language, and then the business people would look at the expressions and then could critique them. Could say, oh, no, that's not quite right, or we have to do something here. So the key thing is the language became a communication channel between the business people and the software developers. This is a particularly classic example of a domain-specific language. The language is small. You couldn't build a whole system in it. It only actually applies to a small but very intricate and key part of the system, and it enables communication um, between the different parts. So it was interesting to see this and, and some other projects that had done these kinds of techniques. But one of the things that I noticed was lacking was an understanding of all of the options available to you in building domain-specific languages. Um, and the thing is, there's not much, certainly not much at the time, that was written to kind of help people do that. I mean, people would typically 
accidentally stumble into one particular technique, learn a bit about it and use that, but not necessarily be able to trade it, to compare it to other techniques and say which is the appropriate technique to use. There are two particular strains of domain specific language. On the one hand is what I've referred to as the old Unix tradition, one that goes back to the very early days of the Unix operating system. Um, in those days, all the key parts of Unix were written in C, which is obviously a very um, low level but powerful language, and also compiled. And people would want to do things at, with a bit more runtime flexibility um, in a language that was a bit higher level. So their approach was to write these small domain specific languages. And you see them all over the place in Unix as various forms of Unix configuration files. And they allow you to express the behavior of some part of a system. And usually the way people would take that is they would design the language pretty much from scratch, write a simple parser, typically using parser generator tools. The early Unixes came with Lex and Yak, which are two very popular parser generator tools, although there are better ones available now. And then they would generate whatever was needed from that. And these are what I refer to as external domain specific languages, in that they are external to your usual programming environment. And then you read them with a parser and introduce it into them. Another style of domain specific language, which has popped up more recently, is what I call internal domain specific languages. Now, the classic example of these these days is in the Ruby community. If you talk to Ruby programmers, they'll often talk about how they create little domain specific languages in Ruby. And what they mean by this is that they have real Ruby code that works as a regular Ruby language, but it doesn't look like regular Ruby. It looks kind of like something very domain specific. Um, and there are lots of examples. A very good example of this is the rake build language that's used for um, coordinating builds in the Ruby world. Um, and the point here is that although it feels like a DSL, it's actually at the same time valid Ruby. So you don't use the parser uh, technique of writing your own parser. Instead, you essentially let calls in your Ruby DSL build up um, the structures that you want to, to process with. Now, this is a, a very popular technique within the Ruby world, but it actually has as long a lineage as the external DSLs. Um, the, typically, the, the people that used this technique the most was the Lispers. Lispers often talk about if you want to solve a problem in Lisp, first you create a dialect of Lisp that allows you to express your problem cleanly, and then you express your problem in that dialect. And so this is the internal DSL. It's also sometimes referred to as an embedded DSL. Now, one of the things I stress very much in the Domain Specific Language book is that you use these internal and external DSLs to build up a model, what I refer to as a semantic model, that captures the actual behavior that you're trying to expose in the language. So um, rather than trying to execute the um, DSL directly, what you, what you do is you take the DSL, process it, build up a little structure in memory of objects or could be a data structure, and then you run the semantics over that data structure. And what this does is it allows you to test this semantic model independently of the languages that populate it, and also to reason about the semantic model independently of the languages that populate it. And this separation of semantic model and input and output languages is something that's really, I felt, was a very central part of doing the main specific languages well. I'd looked at several DSLs, some that had an explicit semantic model and some that hadn't. And to my eyes, the ones that had an explicit semantic model were much easier to understand and work with than those that lacked it. The semantic model also is a much better platform if you want to go ahead and use code generation. Not all DSLs require code generation, um, but those that do, it's much easier if you base it off the semantic model than if you try and munge it together with the input language. So I confess I don't like doing these video things very much, and that's partly because I don't like watching video things like this very much. I'm the last person who wants to sit in front of a computer monitor looking at videos of things. Um, but I guess since you've made it this far, you enjoy it more than I do. So I hope you found it useful and that my discomfort at being a video talking head didn't come over too widely. Um, I hope you'll take a look at the books I've mentioned because uh, that way Pearson will be happy with me and we want them to be happy with me. And uh, do take a look at my website, martinfowler.com. Um, where you'll find all sorts of little bits and pieces, 
that can cast you away for who knows how long. 